You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host for the 72nd time is Cindy Johnson, Leadership Committee member of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses. Hi, Cindy. (laughs) Well, that's exciting. Hello. Today is October 24th, 2021, and this is episode 142 of Lighthearted. Today we'll hear part one of a three-part interview with the Irish lighthouse keeper and author Gerald Butler. The other two parts of the interview will be posted in the next few days. If I ever bury a time capsule telling future generations what lighthouses are and what the job of a lighthouse keeper was, I will put this interview in the box. I really feel privileged to have had the chance to talk with Jerry Butler. Have you ever been to Ireland, Cindy? Oh, not yet. One one day. One day. Well, I hope you get to go, and I uh, expect to go next year, uh, July of next year. You know, if all if everything goes the way I think it's going to go, mm-hmm. uh, I will be going there with the U.S. Lighthouse Society tour. I am really, really looking forward to it, and may maybe even meet our guest uh, in person, Jerry mm-hmm. Butler. Yeah, which would be really exciting for me. Uh, before we listen to part one of the interview, let's give some information about Irish lighthouses and Gerald Butler. There are about 70 lighthouses on the coasts of Ireland today. The oldest is the Hook Lighthouse in County Wexford on the East Coast, which dates back to the 12th century. The Commissioners of Irish Lights, created by an Act of the Parliament of Ireland in 1786, served as the General Lighthouse Authority for Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Great Lighthouses of Ireland is a new tourism initiative developed by the Commissioners of Irish Lights, featuring 12 lighthouses Great Lighthouses of Ireland offers visitors the chance to visit or stay in a lighthouse and to discover more about their history. There's lots of information on this project online at greatlighthouses.com. Gerald Butler is a third generation lighthouse keeper on both sides of his family. He joined the Commissioners of Irish Lights in 1969 and spent most of his career as an assistant keeper on Bull Rock, Fastnet Rock, the Old Head of Kinsale, and Mizzen Head Lighthouses. During his 21 years of service, he also served on 17 other lighthouses. Gerald was born in 1950 in southwestern Ireland. He was an identical twin and one of 15 siblings. When he was two years old, Gerald's family moved to the Galley Head Lighthouse, where his mother's father was the principal keeper and his father was an assistant keeper. Later, his mother was for a time the only female lighthouse keeper in Ireland. Gerald was an assistant keeper at iconic Fastnet Rock Lighthouse in 1979 when the Fastnet Yacht Race disaster occurred. It's considered the worst event in ocean yacht racing history. The staffing of Irish Lighthouses started winding down in the early 1980s and Gerald's lightkeeping career ended in 1990. Gerald was co-author with Patricia O'Hearn of the book The Lightkeeper, a memoir, which was published in 2012. John Gore Grimes of the Commissioners of Irish Lights called the book, quote, Extraordinary, a fascinating history of a lightkeeper and his family, a wonderful record of a unique piece of social history, unquote. Today, Gerald is the attendant keeper at Galley Head Lighthouse, where he conducts historical tours. He also frequently lectures on Irish lighthouses, both from a historical perspective as well as his own experiences. I spoke with Gerald a few weeks ago via Zoom, We spoke for more than two hours, and I found every minute of it fascinating. In part one today, we'll hear about his childhood experiences at the lighthouses and about his training as a keeper, and also about the lighthouses where he began his career. Part two will be posted in two days, on Tuesday, October 26th. And part three will be posted this Thursday, October 28th. So let's listen to part one of my conversation with Irish lighthouse keeper Gerald Butler now. I am speaking this morning, or at least it's morning where I am in New Hampshire, but it's afternoon where he is in Ireland. I'm speaking with uh, Gerald Butler, longtime lighthouse keeper in Ireland, 
uh, still the attendant keeper at Galley Head Lighthouse, one of the things I, I want to talk about today. But Gerald is the, the author of an amazing book, a book I, I really love. I think it's a classic of its type. There's a lot of books about life at lighthouses in one way or another, but Gerald's book, The Lightkeeper, a memoir, uh, co-written with, with Patricia Ahern, is just a, a wonderful book, and I've had so much fun reading it. Thank you so much for being with me, Gerald. It's an absolute pleasure. Let me ask you first, you are, uh, if I have this right, you're a, a third generation lighthouse keeper on both sides of your family. Is that, oh, yeah. is that a cor correct? Yeah, okay. That is quite correct, and, um, Jeremy, yes. Yeah. And that was quite the normal in the Irish Lighthouse Service. First of all, the commissioners of Irish Lights, they didn't want uh, to be putting a lot of people through. So if they got a young lad in as a light keeper, they wanted to hold on to him. Now, the life was a very isolated life. You were going to be on your own for quite uh, long periods. So it's not everybody was up for that. So the Irish Lights then, the commissioners of Irish Lights, they wanted um, light keepers' sons had a good idea of what was to be expected of them. And so would local people living in the vicinity of a lighthouse. They would also have a fairly good understanding um, of what they were going to be asked to do. So it, it, that allowed for the Irish Lights then to become very traditional. But strangely enough, the exact same thing happened on the board of commissioners because uh, going through the, um, the history of the board of commissioners, you would see a lot of the family names going back through the generations as well. Mm -hmm. um, right. Though I'm a third generation light keeper, there are other light keepers who are far more than that. The Irish lights were formed, for instance, in the year 1810. There are uh, names in the Irish lights going back to very close to that period. So it has been handed down all through the years. How do you think uh, being in a family of lighthouse keepers kind of shaped your childhood? Well, the way it shaped my childhood is at the age of four, I remember, now I'm a twin. So mm -hmm. both my twin brother and myself, we were living in Bally Cotton there in East Car. And at the age of four, my father brought my twin brother out to the island for a week. And then I was going out for the second week. And that didn't uh, last, for me, it didn't last. I had to come ashore after maybe three days or four days because we were twins. We were never ever separated. So he wasn't able to uh, tolerate being away, that, that separation. So my mother, got on and said, look, I had to be brought ashore. But nonetheless, there was enough in that for me for, to sow the seeds, if you like, for me to become a lightkeeper. So my twin brother and myself at that age wanted nothing else from that day forward, only to be lightkeepers. You were a lighthouse keeper at the lighthouses for 21 years, right? Yes. And you've continued as an attendant keeper at Galley Head, which we'll talk about. But uh, your uh, your twin brother, uh, how long did he end up being a lighthouse keeper? He remained in the lights for five years. Mm -hmm. And that, after that, he just could not settle himself. He couldn't. He needed interaction with people. So mm -hmm. that's that's the one thing that the Irish lights were trying to avoid was uh, people coming in after about four or five years, realizing that this is not for them and leaving. And then they'd have to start off and train up someone else. So th that's what they were trying to avoid. But no matter how good you'll do something, uh, you'll never get it 100% right. And in this case, they didn't. When we were doing the exam for the Irish Lights, there was a chap from Tipperary, which is almost in the center of Ireland. And he applied for and came up and did the exam with us. And he failed at the interview. And I remember the man who was looking after all of us. He said, don't judge this man, he said, in any way. He said, it's just that we feel he's not going to be able to go the distance. That's why the job operated. I call it a job, but I really, it's not a job. It's a complete way of life. Uh-huh. 
I know uh, a woman I knew, uh, the late Connie Small, who uh, was uh, wrote a book called The Lighthouse Keeper's Wife, spent almost 30 years with her husband at lighthouses, mostly in Maine. Uh, she said it was a calling. She said uh, lighthouse keeping wasn't a job. It was a calling. I don't know if you... Uh, uh, yes, I do. Oh, I, I really do. I suppose it may not be right to say you become institutionalized into that way of thinking, but certainly... Um, somebody described it to me quite recently as a vocation. So yeah. for me, it certainly was all of that because I'm still at it and I do not ever, ever, like your good self, want to retire. I completely understand. Yeah, I do feel the same way. So uh, you mentioned your twin brother. Uh, you were, uh, you and he were uh, among tw- f- 15 siblings, 15 siblings in all. Do you think living at remote lighthouses when you were young, did that make it easier or harder for your mother to raise such a large family, do you think? Oh, that simplified things hugely. Because when we were living in Dundalk, you see, in the Irish Lights, we moved around the coast. We might spend four or five or six years at a lighthouse and you were transferred somewhere else. We went to Dundalk, I would have been about eight years of age. So when we were up there, Those few years, eight to 10, my father was out on the uh, lighthouse and we were living ashore right on the outskirts of the town. So at night, we were slipping off out, uh, joining up with gangs, doing all the wrong kind of things that a parent Mm -hmm. does not want to see their children doing. So I remember my father when he came ashore from the rock and he said that he was going to do something about it. So he contacted an inspector and he explained the situation to him. And um, the inspector said, right, we'll arrange a transfer. So we were then sent to a place called Minehead. Minehead, it's near Dungarvan in County Waterford. And um, it's uh, very remote in that there is a big, long uh, laneway, not untarred, a rough road uh, right to the lighthouse. Both our parents were there to keep an eye on the family. The family was increasing in size all the time. Living out on these places, it it changed at a very impressionable time. It changed the way we think. It honed us in again, back into where we were to wind up really. Now, do you think uh, growing up at lighthouses as you did, did you, uh, along the way, did you learn the skills of being a lighthouse keeper when you were very young? Absolutely, because now we were with our father. When we were with our father, he taught us everything we needed to know about painting, about lime washing, about pulling the flags up the the flag mast. He used to teach us uh, signaling. He he actually bought the flash lamps for us to practice our Morse code at night. And he did a lot of stuff like that. And we were with him all the time, every step of the way. We were living on a, a cliff top. So we used to go fishing. He used to bring us down, climb it's a very, very steep cliff. And he used to bring us down, he used to show us how to climb it. I remember one of the things he told us, don't ever throw a stone when you're on a cliff or if there's anyone down a cliff. Do not be throwing stones into the water because you quite easily could start an avalanche. Things like that. We were really being groomed for this all the time. And at the time, did you feel that lighthouse keeping was a kind of a special way of life, a special vocation, or was it more a matter of fact kind of thing? How, what were your feelings about that? A bit of both, really. It was a matter of fact in that that's what we were doing. Uh, that's what our parents did. For instance, if a young lad on a farm, uh, working with his father on a farm, he thinks that the farming is normal. To a certain extent, it is. So... That's where we were. I remember when we were in school, when the teacher wanted to write on a subject. For for instance, one of the subjects was teaching us letter writing. He picked the lighthouse uh, for an address. Things like that, they stay with you so you you know that it's not really the norm. What was uh, the standing of lighthouse keepers in the community? Were Were they highly respected? They were, lightkeepers were respected because I suppose travel broadens the mind. A lot of the keepers came into the Irish Lights from being at sea. My own father now, 
uh, he was at sea as a young lad and traveled all around the world. So they would have picked up a huge amount of uh, stories to tell all through their lives. So he used to, if he was up in the pub or in, in with local people, he could sit and talk to them for hours about stuff that they did not know anything about. And he could explain it to them and um, kind of, if you like, bring them on a, on, a, on a kind of a journey. So things like that, we were then seen as kind of a people apart, if you like. What were some of the things you and your siblings did for entertainment when you were living at the lighthouses? Getting back first to the delinquency part. <laughs> I remember my mother said to me years later, she said, if we had have stayed in Dundalk, she said she had no doubt in her mind but myself and my twin would probably have wound up in the IRA. It was necessary yeah. to get us out of it. Mm -hmm. Then when we were at um, living at Minehead, there was a principal keeper uh, sent to Minehead, and he was a single man. He used to do shooting. He had a .22 rifle, and he also had a, a shotgun. And we used to spend our time inside in the house with him. So we, he used to bring us off shooting, climbing the cliffs, gathering uh, wreckage flotsam and uh, bringing all this stuff back. So our lives were changing. In a way, you could say they were stepping back, but they were changing. We were certainly no way involved in any form of delinquency. And we were still growing and learning a complete new, different type of skills our lives were now going to be spent in lighthouses or on clifftops. You know? So jumping ahead uh, to your own lightkeeping career, what made you decide to become a lighthouse keeper when you were 19? 18 was the age that you could uh, join into the Irish Lights. From that time I told you about in school, my education was completely pointed in one direction only, and that is uh, I had to gain a trade of some sort or enough skills to allow me to become a lightkeeper. So my education, uh, it was non-academic. Then I wanted nothing else whatsoever. But I went to the local, what we call the tech, the um, technical college, uh, and it was just a basic second level. But in there, I learned, first of all, gardening. We learned a little bit of horticulture. I learned a bit of biology. I learned uh, then the, the, the trades. I learned about electricity, magnetism and electricity. We learned rural science. We learned woodwork. We learned um, metal work. All these things that you'd learn in the, in the school that teaches the trades. These were absolutely of great importance and were going to become of greater importance as we uh, grew up because when you're out on a lighthouse and you need something breaks down, you're the only person. So you have to be able to fix it. Priority number one is to make sure that the light is lighting at night and that mm -hmm. the fog signal is functioning. So in our skills, though we were not engineers, nonetheless, we were able to dismantle, correct, even if we had to file a piece and make a piece to fit. You were able to do all of those kind of things. At the age of uh, seven, 17 or 18, I forget now. Anyway, we applied to do the exam when the exam was being held. So we did. We did the exam. Then we had to wait until a vacancy arose because promotion in the Irish Lights is based on seniority, mm -hmm. uh, not on merit. So you, you, we had to just wait that period until the vacancy arose. And then I joined into the lights and my twin, he was in immediately after me. So, uh, it was interesting reading about your, your period as a, what's, what is called there a supernumerary light, yeah. uh, light keeper. We don't have that term in this country, but it's basically a trainee uh, keeper. It's basically so, a trainee, a trainee. The word means uh, not belonging. So you're not belonging to anything you're, Floating, shall we say? <laughs> um, um, so uh, we were based in uh, in in the Bailey Lighthouse in Dublin. At our examination, we had to be able to swim. You did a swimming exam, 
we had to be, uh, you had to do a very severe stiff medical exam and um, a written exam and, um, and an interview. When you were passed with all of that and called up, you went to the Bailey Lighthouse, you collected your bed bag and whatever you took with you. And you didn't take that much, you just needed, like all I had was two hand grips with my clothes in them and my bed bag, that's all. Because I was now going to spend the next four years traveling all around the country to different lighthouses, you did not want to be dragging uh, heavy bags or suitcases with you. So those three things, that's what I used to carry. The first year then you were on probation. I think in America, you call them rookies. <laughs> and every lighthouse you visited, you'd go to do a fortnight or a month at that station uh, because you'd be doing relief work. Somebody would be gone sick, are doing holidays work. And while you were there then, you learned off everything about that light. You learned off everything about uh, what type of a fog signal it was. And also the day marks at the station, you really learned everything off about that station. And it's an amazing thing when you learned it off, or at least in my case anyway, I suppose that's all I can say, you never forgot it. And the reason I never forgot it is I may not have known then that I had a deep passion for this. It was, it was a, a tremendous learning. At the end of that year, you went back with your proficiency form, which was signed by every principal keeper uh, where you visited. We redid another exam then. So the, the second exam was more on what you had learned, your Morse code, your semaphore, your signal. So you were now able to send messages. You're, we had... Uh, a lot of radio work done. So you were uh, quite proficient at speaking on the radio and delivering and taking messages. All of that kind of thing, rigging derricks, most of it was seamanship. So you, you were put through your paces. You also did a second medical exam then after that. And mm -hmm. then you were a fully fledged light, light keeper. You were still a supernumerary because you were still not belonging to any station. In my particular case, uh, I had to wait for four years before a vacancy came for me to be appointed. And then I was appointed to a place called the Bull Rock, which is down off uh, the, the Dorsey Island at the mouth of Kenmare River, up where the borders of Cork and Kerry lie. One of the first lighthouses um, among the, uh, the first ones where you were assigned was uh, in the Blasket Islands. Right. Inish tears. Inish Thank you. Tears. Now, the Inish is the Irish word for island, and Tirith mm -hmm. is Western, Western Island. Um, so Inish, Inish Tirith? Inish yeah. Tirith? Do I have that? Inish okay. Tirith. So it was, it was really just known as the Tirith. The Tirith has a, has a tremendous history attached to it as well, because it goes way, way back. The, the Spanish used to call, um, in the maps they drew, they had Inish Tirith away out in the Atlantic. So it was very important for them for coming in from for their fishing and that. It's known as Green Isle, which is the higher part of the rock. And a High Brazil is the part where the lighthouse was built. They're connected by a natural bridge built with falling rubble over the years. There's a chasm goes right straight through it. Inish Tirith or Tirith was never covered with ice during the ice age. So there's a pile of loose soil. It's dangerous to climb it. And, and some people have lost their lives climbing it. And it's it goes up to about 70 or 700 feet high. We used to have a garden there. There were rabbits introduced there uh, sometime in the 1800s, just before 1840s. They were never contaminated with the myxomatosis and they bred and continued to breed profusely. Mm -hmm. The trouble with the rabbits out there is they're burrowing and the burrowing causes small landslides. So the vegetation is slipping into the ocean with the rabbits. It's amazing uh, when we human beings introduce something, we can change um, the whole future of a, of a, of a place like an Ishtar. Oh, absolutely. There's no doubt about that. But uh, that looks absolutely spectacular in pictures. Uh, yes, it is quite, beautiful. Quite when I was there as a, as a supernumerary, 
Um, again, because I was now able to use my hands, I gathered up enough scrap metal material and I climbed to the summit with it. For, it took an entire day to do this. And I erected a weather vane on top of it, a massive, big, strong, heavy weather vane. It was great because Inish Tirat has a lot of air turbulence around it because of the shape of the rock. So when the wind is blowing, um, it's quite difficult to get a true direction of the wind when you're out there. So when I put this weather vane up on the top, for the 10 years that it lasted, it operated beautifully. And um, it was great for the pilots uh, when they were coming in with the helicopters. These rocks are so, so dangerous to land on. When the pilot was one day trying to land on Inish Tirith, the vibration inside the helicopter was so severe that it actually caused a nut on the engine to back off and an alarm triggered and the pilot had to abandon his landing and head straight in for Mount Brandon and Kerry and land the helicopter. So it can be quite dangerous landing on with the turbines. Yeah. So you mentioned the uh, the weather vane you installed at Inner Monitoring the weather was uh, an important part of the, the job of lighthouse keepers, right? Yes. Historically, we are the earliest recorders of weather in this country. Uh, first of all, we did a fog watch. And a fog watch, every hour, we recorded the weather. So what we were recording really was the state of the sea. We were recording the um, amount of cloud that was in the sky and um, the wind direction and strength and, the, ter and the, the temperature. And then we had another weather book that we used to record every four hours for ourselves. And we did barometrical pressure and pretty much the same thing, but a few more, more refined uh, measures than that. And we would sign that one when we were signing off watch. So when you were signing off watch, you recorded the weather. So we had a four hour and an every hour recording of the weather. Laterally then, the Met Service in, in Dublin asked us, would we um, record weather for them every four hours? And we did, they sent us special equipment for uh, recording the weather. And what I liked about that, what I found interesting about it, was everything was done in numbers. So there was a complete series. So like, for instance, the direction the wind is blowing from. If it's south, the number is 180. If it's west, the number is 270. If it's east, it's 90. So you can divide it up in between. And that was uh, the numbers we do in it. The force, again, on the Beaufort, uh, up to 10. Um, more than that was a um, violent storm. But again, it was done in numbers. Clouds, the cloud coverage, we divided that into numbers as well. So. The weather for the Met Service was just a series of uh, figures you were calling out, uh, two, five, uh, mm -hmm. and the next one would be six, seven, and whatever way it worked, you know? But I thought that that was, I thought it was very well thought out. Also speaking of weather, and you just uh, mentioned fog too, there's a big part of that weather, but some of the light stations had fog horns. Did you get used to living with the, the incredible sound of those, those horns? I did. The way I describe the, the, the sound of the foghorns, if you were living and let's say there was a, a train passing very close to your house at a regular time, you'd, you'd eventually get to the point where you'd hardly take any notice of that. I remember being on the Tirith again, or Inish Tirith, I was still a supernumerary, and the fog rolled in as the fog would do down, down there for... Uh, for no reason at all. It had just come in. The fog lasted for days. And we had a, a diaphone fog horn there and we had the engines running. So you get so used to listen, listening to the engines uh, or the, the, the sound of the engines as they were, the compressors were pumping up the air. The air had to be pumped up just 30 pounds of pressure per square inch, which isn't a lot, but the volume was massive. So once the uh, 30 pounds was reached, you'd get used to the tone of the engine changing. And then you get used to the sound of the uh, blasts from the um, trumpet. And 
then you'd hear the engine picking up again and starting to pump the pressure. And that sequence would go on so long and you get so used to it that you wouldn't hear it. And I remember that particular thing happening. And then when the fog did clear and the sun shone, it was a beautiful day. I was um, on the middle of the night watch from 2 a.m. until 6 a.m. In the morning, I just could not sleep. The silence, I was able to hear the seagulls who, that I had absolutely paid no attention to whatsoever. <laughs> uh -huh. And the same happened. We also had explosive fog signals. We fired a lot of those. They were very labor intensive. We would give our hours firing those off. You see, the beautiful thing about the explosives was that it meant that the Irish lights didn't have to go and build engine rooms. They didn't have to go and procure engines. Back in the day when engines had huge, big four and five foot flywheels, the weights of all these things had to be carried out. Single cylinder, horizontal stroke engines were massive things. And um, gems today, if you could get your hands on them. So the explosive fog signal, all we were doing was just landing the charges and the detonators, and we were firing those at regular intervals. But it was very labor intensive. You were really on your own doing that in the firing hut. During the War of Independence, during the Irish War of Independence, the IRA raided almost every lighthouse. I'm unsure about Inish Tirith. I feel they didn't raid Inish Tirith. I never came across any information that they did. The next lighthouse to Inish Tirith is Skellig Michael, which has a huge history going back into Irish mythology. The IRA raided that at least six times, if not nine. And similarly with Mizzen Head, they also raided the Bull Rock. They raided the galley where I look after. They wound up in the finish just taking uh, what they needed for uh, their own activities. So because they were getting such bad PR in the media, because they were now leaving ships exposed to crashing onto the rocks, when they would raid a lighthouse, they would say, we're leaving you with 24 hours continuous flat firing. So mm. that meant that in that period, we had to get a message out that we needed more explosives. And uh, also speaking of uh, fog signals, how do you feel about the fact that Ireland, I think it was maybe 10 years ago-ish, uh, yes, that Ireland right. discont yeah, discontinued all its fog signals? It did. In the year 2011, all fog signals stopped. Yeah, I, 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 I didn't like it. Um, I absolutely loved, uh, when I was in Dublin, when I was a, a supernumerary up at the Bailey, uh, we had a diaphone. Uh, at the Bailey Lighthouse, so you'd have that blowing. There was another one over on the East Pier in Dunleary, eight miles across the harbour, so that would be sounding. And then you had the boys, and they were blowing as well. Plus, if there was any ships coming and going, they would also be sounding foghorns. So there was a cacophony of um, sound in Dublin Bay. And I remember uh, just thinking to myself, one day they are li listening to it all. I thought it was absolutely beautiful. And that mm -hmm. all absolutely stopped. Ships still use them now and again, just to warn of themselves. What was it like when the inspector came to the light stations? Well, the inspector, of course, um, we had to have the place uh, in spotless condition. Now, when I say that to you, we really had the place in spotless condition anyway, because we had plenty of time to keep it clean. So we used to just keep it clean. Out on these outlying rocks, the place was so unbelievably spotlessly clean. You could spill your dinner down on the floor, get down and eat it off it. It was so clean. And what that meant then was when we were in our own lives at home, this became part of the norm for us to be uh, clean inside the house as well. When an inspection was coming then, we... All we had to do was just um, go over the place, make sure everything was where it should be. Then we would dress in our, our dress uniform and we would put up the flag and um, have the station looking properly. An annual inspection by the commissioners every year. So the inspector would travel with the commissioners 
so would the uh, chief engineer and you had the board of commissioners. So they would come to a lighthouse, to a station, and they went through absolutely every single thing at that station. Now, for us then, uh, supposing we wanted certain works carried out that we would see ourselves as being important. For us, this was the fast track because we would uh, take a commissioner and we would say to him, you see that thing there? Uh, we want, um, the reason we want this done with that or whatever, and they would call the engineer and he would say to the engineer, look, um, what we're wanting done here is uh, that job done down on the landing to make it safer or whatever. Get that done within 12 months. Otherwise, we'd have to write letters. Uh, somebody would have to come and do an inspection. Somebody would have to come and measure it. And, you know, the bureaucratic way of doing things. For us, this was the fast track, getting through that. Inspections, I enjoyed. I really did. Let's talk about Fastnet. Uh, you were stationed at Fastnet, which is one of the iconic, if not the most iconic lighthouses, Lighthouse of Ireland, up the southern tip. It's, it's an amazing place. Uh, when did you first go to Fastnet? What were your first impressions of the place? The first time I went to Fastnet was in the, in the year 1969. I joined the Irish Lights in October. My first station was Wicklow Head. Then uh, I went down to Inish Tears. Then I went to Fast for Christmas uh, that year. And I can still remember, now I'd known about the Fastnet from when I was a child because keepers coming and going to the lighthouse were always talking about the Fastnet. They were always talking about um, other stations as well, but the Fastnet always featured. When the helicopter landed and took off again, and I was, I got on the rock, I will never forget going in the door of the tower. Uh, it was intimidating. The tower was so big. It was a massive, massive, uh, structure from the outside and then you had this big skirt line effect as the tower uh, it shaped like a bell it, it spread out as it went down and even that was kind of intimidating once I got inside the door of the lighthouse everything changed you were now in a lighthouse so I had been in in quite a few of them they were all pretty much the same the stairs going up the handrail and in fastness when you went up the first flight well, first of all, down at the very bottom, there are these bronze storm shutter doors. They weigh a half ton each. They're, it's actually called Mun's Metal, a type of a bronze. When the doors are closed, they are totally watertight. But water can still come in. There was a scupper hole in the bottom because water will come in through the channels that were made for uh, the oil pipes coming in from outside. And when the sea would be going over the fastnet, if you were down in the bottom of it, every wave would splurge up into the bottom of the lighthouse. There'd be a couple of feet of water inside. And then that would be draining out through the scupper hole in the bottom of the door. When you go up the first flight of stairs, the engine room there had uh, two water-cooled Lister diesel generators uh, with a belt-driven generator beside it, alternator beside it, and had to be belt driven because you weren't able to get enough length in to have the engine coupled to the alternator. So the alternator was beside it. So it was a, as a kind of a block. So there were two of those there. The water that circulated through those engines was uh, piped up into the next flight. And there was a tank, a, a fine big tank there. And in that tank was a heat sink, a heat transfer system for the central heating. So out of that tank came our central heating and was piped all the way up through the tower. The tower itself was actually quite comfortable. And in the summertime, it could be a bit extreme. Uh, mm -hmm. To accommodate that, they put radiators out on top of the balcony to dump the heat in the summertime because you had to use the same engines, you were generating the same heat and you couldn't tolerate it inside in the lighthouse. It made the lighthouse quite comfortable. So that was in that room. There was a, a third generator in that flight as well, just above the engine room. And then above that, I built a workshop in 
that that was an empty flight. And I used to spend a lot of time uh, creating in the workshop. Then the flight above that, uh, let me think now, yeah, the flight above that, you came into the workman's bedroom. And the flight above that, you came into the keeper's bedroom. So the in the, let's take the keeper's bedroom. Uh, in that, there were three bunk beds. So there was one bed down on the ground, and it was up under the window. And then there were two more, because it was circular, there were two more fastened on to the wall above that, but one at the head and one at the foot. So you weren't directly down, down, looking down on top of the man beneath you. My bunk was uh, one of the upper bunks and you had to be careful because you could lie in the bed and reach up with your hand and strike the ceiling. You were very close to the, the ceiling. The flight above that then was, that was where we had the fridges and it was pretty much the office, if you like. But the, the, the next two flights really were the same. We had the what we call the service room up above that, which also served as our kitchen. And that's where a lot of the office work was done by the principal keeper uh, when he'd be writing of the expenditures that he would have had. So your watch keeping then was done up there on the very top. You could come out of the door there and straight onto the balcony. It was very, very handy for weather recording. Every time you went out onto the balcony, you knew the direction of the wind instantly. And um, when we were there, whoever was on watch would be going in and out all the time, keeping an eye around, checking everything. If the wind changed its direction, even if it was only the tiniest little point, he would come in and tell us. So, um, and, and that was to be expected. It was just naturally expected that if he didn't tell us, it wouldn't matter, but you just naturally did. So the three keepers on the fastnet always knew the direction the wind was blowing from, and they always knew the strength of it. Out on fastnet, that was very, very, very necessary to know that. It was necessary to know if you were outside on top of the rock, because I remember one night uh, about three in the morning, and I was out on top of the helicopter platform. I was just walking on top of that. And it was a beautiful morning. And the wind shifted to the west. You'd know the minute it shifted. But 10 minutes after that happening, the first wave came up around the door of the lighthouse. So I had to get in on it. So there are the reasons you would know. And you had to know it. Speaking of waves there, you described, I think uh, in the book you described, uh, you were, I think, sitting in a chair inside Fastnet when a giant wave hit there and it was a something pretty startling. Your description was great of that. Can you describe what that was like? When there's a storm uh, blowing at sea, out in the ocean, the, w the waves will rise uh, to about 30 or 40 feet without any difficulty. Now, as the waves are, are coming in, the pressure, the air pressure has declined, has lightened. So that allows the waves to rise because the pressure is down somewhere else, the water will, will balance itself. When the, wa the wave moves in onto shallower ground, it would double in height. So there's a reef about a half a mile west of the fastnet. And you'd, you'd see the waves coming. As soon as they go over that reef, they rise up like mountains. And they just move and they will gain speed. And they would hit the tower at what I reckon to be about uh, 60 or 70 miles an hour. Modestly, I was saying 50. And what happens then is when the top is blown off the wave because the wind is driving it on so fast, the top uh, keeps getting blown off it. And when it hits the bottom of the tower first, and this is inst almost instantaneous, it traps pockets of air down in the bottom of the rock. Uh, where, because the rock is so jagged and uh, the way the lighthouse is built, that's where the pressure builds up. As the wave is moving in, uh, just around top dead centre, there's an explosion because it has compressed the air so much that the air bursts. And if you're inside in the lighthouse, it's just like a bomb. And it happens so swiftly. Uh, with the wave coming in. Then the air from that explosion will tear into the incoming wave 
and give it the heel that it needs. And that will lift thousands on top of more thousand tons of water. A the lighthouse is 163 feet high and to put it so high up over the lighthouse. So when you're inside in the tower, at least for me anyway, when I was inside in it, uh, you'd hear this explosion at the bottom. You'd hear the rush of water coming up over the tower. The air inside would compress. You'd feel it on your lungs. And I, I remember I used to always run to the barometer just to watch the needle of the barometer and it'd be dancing up and down. And then if you were sitting in your chair, which is what I described in that book, it was a steel chair I was sitting on. And I remember I said to the lads in the very beginning, this chair is made out of rubber. And they said, mm. no, Jerry, it's not. It's the tower is wobbling. So the, the vibrations can be so severe in the tower that the tower will appear. And it actually will a lean over. Now, they say it can go three feet off center. So I remember being on it one night and like that, this is what was um, happening. And there was one wave performed much differently in that we heard nothing, absolutely nothing. And then this massive wave hit the tower high up on top. The jolt was so severe that if I did not put my foot out to correct my balance, I would have fallen inside the lighthouse up on the very top. And of course, water came in, the water came up through the kitchen sink and the smell of it, it shot away up in the air. <laughs> All that kind of um, stuff goes on with it. I love the fact that you've really uh, an are analyzing it in a scientific sense. I think most people just say, wow, that was a big wave or say something that yes. we probably can't repeat here, but. Well, what I did to, to, to gain that knowledge, the, I, I had a, an inquiring mind and I sat in normal conditions and I gave hours on top of hours just watching the waves coming at the fastnet and trying to time them. Mm -hmm. So that's how I, how I came up with my 60 or 70 miles an hour. Because I remember watching a wave passing. I remember thinking to myself, if I was in a rib, I'd hardly keep up with it. So I reckon that's the, that's the way I would determine the speed of the wave. You can read more about Gerald Butler on his website at thelightkeeper.ie. You can order his book, The Lightkeeper, a memoir, directly from his website. In the second part of my interview with Gerald, one of the things we discussed was the Fastnet yacht racing disaster in 1979. It was a terrible thing, but I think our listeners will find Gerald's description riveting. Special thanks to all the staff, volunteers, and members of the U.S. Lighthouse Society. Check out uslhs.org to learn about all the things the society does. If you work to preserve lighthouses or any kind of history, we thank you for everything you do. Here's an old Irish saying to close this episode. May your day be touched by a bit of Irish luck, brightened by a song in your heart, and warmed by the smiles of the people you love. As always, thanks for listening and... Keep a good light. All in my house, I'm gonna let it shine. All in my house, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine